Heavenly Father, we ask the blessing on the reading of your word. May your Holy Spirit be our guide today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth, Part 5. This is just a small introduction just to get uh, the idea uh, for people because I think we come across a lot of passages in the Bible that we don't understand and they get uh, wrongly interpreted. I know that happened for me in my life. And as I've studied God's Word and understood better how to rightly divide, I want to pass that on so other people understand it. Well, I've been talking, uh, the scripture says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we talked on day one, there's there's simple divisions, Old Testament, New Testament. You know, as we study it, we understand that, uh, I haven't talked about this one yet, but uh, th- there needed to be the death of a testator. Uh, it talks about that in, in scripture. And w- what's that talking about? It's it, it, the end of the Old Testament was it came about uh, with uh, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, that uh, he's the one who kept the law. And uh, that started a new testament, the death of that testator, you know, to start the New Testament, the covenant uh, that God kept, that he would send a Messiah. Well, Uh, We're up to uh, dispensation. We've been talking about dispensation. We're talking a little bit about the dispensation of law today. I believe that when we use a single hermeneutic, again, what is that? Uh, As we study scripture and as we look at scripture, uh, hermeneutics is is the method for scripture study. And when we use a single hermeneutic that we take scripture at its literal ordinary uh, primary meaning when we do that and we and we say well this is what it basically says there there's a a rule when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense seek no other sense there are some scriptures that can just stand alone john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life that uh, salvation is by grace, it's by trusting Christ and all what he did on the cross, nothing that we can add. Well, as you study scripture from a literal method, you find that there are what are called dispensations. Dispensations are periods of time where God works with man in a different way, but that didn't change the method of salvation. There are some people who get into what is called hyper dispensationalism and believe that man was saved in different ways throughout the Bible, that in part it was his works, but the Bible clearly says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. There's not going to be anyone in heaven boasting in what they did. Romans 4 makes it clear that Abraham was saved by faith. It makes it clear that David said, blessed is the man whose uh, sins are forgiven, to whom God will not impute sin, who who is just saved without works, it says in Romans 4. I would encourage you to read Romans 4 today and look, because the, the Old Testament uh, saints were given as our examples of people who trusted, and that's all they did. They just trusted that a Messiah would come and one day pay for their sin. Well, it, the dispensation of law started in Exodus 19.8 to Matthew 27.35. Actually, as we go into the New Testament, we understand that, see, Christ, his life, he was still under the law. He was still there during the time of uh, the sacrifice, and he was still uh, keeping the law, and uh, he did, he had no sin. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been the perfect sacrifice for sin. But all the sacrifices that were done in the Old Testament as they were given, they all pointed to the cross. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail into these things, but I'm going to point out one thing. You know, um, Exodus 31, 16 says, Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath, Observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, see, Jews will still honor the Sabbath. They were under no requirement as as the church of God to keep 
the Sabbath day, but there's a special covenant between God and his chosen people, the nation of Israel. And they're still his chosen people. He hasn't cast them off forever. They just, for the most part, have rejected the Messiah. They haven't trusted Christ as their savior. But one day he's going to come back and work with them. But the Sabbath day, we should have a day where we honor the Lord. And truthfully, the Lord is, we should be honoring the Lord every day of our life, all seven days of the week. As a believer, we should be desiring to live for him. We have a choice after we get saved. Some days we may not live for him as much as we do in others. And then we have to say, boy, Lord, I wasted that day. I, I missed out on a blessing. And, and many times it's going to be an eternal blessing, uh, not even so much of a temporary blessing here that we need to learn to lay up our treasures in heaven. But we worship on Sunday because in Scripture they worshiped on the Lord's Day, the day he rose again. Well, we are now, that brings us after law when Christ went to the cross and he was rose again. There's, there's a transition period in there, and that's in the book of Acts. And when I taught through the book of Acts, uh, you know, I explained that th that's where some people mistakenly get a lot of uh, doctrine for their churches. You shouldn't use Acts in terms of uh, Christian practice. It doesn't mean that it's not sound uh, Bible. That's not what I'm saying, but it shouldn't be where we're using that in terms of the speaking of tongues and things like that, that that was a transitional period. By the way, tongues are languages. There's nothing wrong with speaking in other tongues, but um, people get their doctrine for Christian practices many times wrongly out of Acts, and it was a transitional period, you know. So, um, for instance, we look in Acts chapter 8, where they laid hands on people who had not yet received the Holy Ghost. Well, then in Acts 10, if you read in Acts 10, uh, these believers Im immediately upon belief received the Holy Ghost, and it's been that way ever since, that upon belief, it's a gift uh, to the believer. And that was that transition period from law into grace. Well, John 1.17 says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So salvation is by grace. It's God's unmerited favor. We, we can't do anything to earn it. And it came when Jesus Christ came. Uh, Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. See, there was a promise made that he would be a blessing to the whole world. We talked about that. And if you go back again to Genesis 12, uh, 1, 2, and 3, in verse 3, that he would be a blessing to the whole world world. But the land promise and the uh, nation promise was specifically to Abraham, passed then to Isaac, passed to Jacob, and to the Jewish people that that land uh, would one day be ruled and reigned by their Messiah. And Christ is going to come back and he's going to live up to that promise as well. But Galatians 3.18 says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. You see, we can't be saved by the law. If you go in Romans 11.6, it's either all of grace or it's all of works. And, and that doesn't mean that once you're saved, you want to go on living in any way that you should. Okay? Um, but I believe it's possible, and I believe... We all do, okay? So one thing that's clear, we still have a free will after we're saved, and we have a choice into service. And that's where we're going to get into next week that I'm going to talk about passages that speak of service. We shouldn't confuse them with salvation. And as we learn to rightly divide, we'll say, well, this one talks, I got to do something. Well, if you, got, if you have to do something, and most of the time in Scripture, we'll talk next week, you'll see the word should, that we should do these things. But not that we're required to do them or we're not saved. And that'll hopefully make it a lot clearer for a lot of people. Acts 16.30 says, uh, this was the Philippian jailer. And he says, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? We're still in this dispensation of, of grace. And uh, Acts 31, they could have told him anything they wanted. 
So to be clear, you know, here they've got this guy and they've got the clearest point here. Here's what you have to do to be saved. You know, and they could have said, you got, you got to keep the law. You got to do all these things. Here's what they said. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then it says, and thy house. Now that doesn't mean his, his house needed to trust him. The people in his house, his family, they needed to trust Christ too. That's what it's saying. But to be saved, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that what he did on the cross was for you. And that's salvation. Okay, and and we're presenting the the uh, in the dispensation of grace. Now we're not in the kingdom. When Jesus first came, he offered the kingdom in Matthew. He said, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." What he was saying is, "I'm offering the millennial reign. I'm here. I'm I'm your Messiah." And the Jews rejected him. And just to briefly mention it, there's. Uh, these 70 weeks that were determined upon Daniel, and we've got the last week that it was, you know, all these weeks that were happening in terms of a judgment upon the nation of Israel uh, in the book of Daniel, the, the last week uh, is still yet to happen, and that's the uh, tribulation. That time clock is on hold because we went into the dispensation of grace, but that's a whole different uh, story. But that one last week when the rapture happens, that 70th week of Daniel, which is a, la a seven-year period, that seven-year period will be uh, happening on earth when his church is taken out, Christ's church is taken out, his bride. Ephesians 1.10, the kingdom, the, the last... Uh, dispensation that will happen. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. One day he's going to take uh, all of those in him. He's going to bring us back. We're going to rule and reign with him on earth. It says in Revelation 19, 11, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And he's going to come back. He's going to bring his saints back with him. And uh, he is known as the word of God. That's Jesus. We see that in the gospel of John. John, of course, uh, was uh, the apostle that penned Revelation as well. But his name is the word of God. He's clothed in that vesture dipped in blood. Revelation 19, it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall, see, he's going to, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty. Back in Psalm chapter 2, it says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Who's this king? It's Christ, set on, on the holy hill of Zion. That's in, uh, he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You see, that salvation is putting your trust in him. Even there, he says he's going to come back. He's going to rule and reign after the tribulation. That's what he's going to do. He's going to come back and rule and reign uh, from Jerusalem. So uh, we'll get into this next week, but I'll end here for today. We're going to end on this one uh, just to give, uh, there are a lot of passages that are difficult in scripture. And as we learn to rightly divide, here's one of the things I think we should always keep in mind. I think when you have John 3, 16 in your eye, it says, for God so loved the world. Again, who, who's the world? That's anyone and everyone. Okay. That 
he, it, the Bible says he commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that God loves his creation, but he hates our sin. And then he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's when he went to the cross. That's how he commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. See, when you trust Christ, when you believe on him, you know now you can't go to hell. And when you know you can't go to hell, then you understand the last part, but have everlasting life. If you've trusted him, you know that you cannot go to hell. It's impossible to lose your salvation. And there are many more verses that we can go through. Uh, we just went through one, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, so when you've trusted him, blessed are they that put their trust in him, Psalm 2. We can go over it over and over, but so many people, I think they struggle with knowing that they're saved, thinking they can somehow lose it because they read a difficult passage. When you're rightly dividing the word of truth, you understand you cannot lose your salvation and that it's a done deal. And I want people as they go through these to know, no, I have eternal life. But then I want them to say, now what? And, and I want them to say, now I should start serving the Lord. How can I serve the Lord? Well, you get into his word and you ask him, Lord, open the door. Tell me what I'm supposed to be doing for you. I, he has a lot of work. He says, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers into the harvest. We'll end there for this week, but next week we'll get into some difficult passages as we continue to rightly divide the word of truth that you may have run across and you might say, well, that sure seems like I could lose my salvation or that sure seems like this. That was just a brief introduction. Uh, I didn't mean to maybe go into the dispensations as much as I did, but that was very brief in terms of going into those. We could go uh, deeply into every dispensation. But just remember that God has separated his word. When you study it and you look at it, you'll find that there were these different time periods. We don't have to do certain things because they don't apply to us. Some of them never ended, like we talked about uh, human government. That one is still in effect, that government still is able to uh, judge and and we should we should. Uh, if we're doing what is right, we have no reason to fear the rulers. That doesn't mean the rulers can't uh, be against us because the heart of man is is wicked. But we always want to do what's right. We should always want to serve God and put him first as believers. May the Lord bless you with the reading of his word today.